Okay, great. Um, perhaps we'll we'll start here. Thanks everyone for joining us today at this meeting of the Australian Sensitive Data Interest Group. Uh, this is an interest group that's co-facilitated by ARDC, the Australian Data Archive, PHRN, and MDAP. Um, so um, let's move on. I, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we're meeting uh, today. As I was saying, I'm in Canberra, so that's the uh, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, as I was saying, this is a very cold land at the moment, but it's beautiful land to be on. The sky is blue and the light is bright and clear, and uh, it's a great privilege to be joining you from this land. So uh, as you may have noticed, the meeting is currently being recorded so that people who can't join us today um, can uh, find it on our YouTube channel. Um, so for that reason, if you uh, don't want to be captured by the recording, I would recommend that you turn off your um, camera and microphone and that way you won't show up in it at all. Um, I would ask that everyone here turn off their microphone anyway during the presentation, just so that we don't get any uh, audio interruptions. Um, but if you don't mind accidentally showing up in the recording occasionally, then um, it would be great to leave your camera on and that way our presenters can see a couple of friendly faces. Um, so a couple of uh, bits of um, admin before we get started. Uh, for those of you who aren't already on it, we have a mailing list for this interest group. Uh, that mailing list is where we advertise meetings that are coming up, we share news, but also you're able to post to the mailing list so you can ask questions. Um, we had a bit of discussion a little while ago about uh, the way that data relating to children is classified in different universities, which was quite interesting. And I would love for us to have more discussions like that. Um, so if you want to sign up to the mailing list, I will post a, a link in the chat once I've stopped sharing my screen so that you can go there and sign up. Um, we, I will also be posting a link to our collaborative notes document. Um, so that document will be open to edit during this meeting. Uh, we. Uh, put in there uh, a space to take notes, um, to record, and I encourage everyone to take notes. We record um, useful links that have been posted in the chat, things like that all go in there. Um, we also have the recordings and slides for all of our previous meetings and the recordings and sli recording and slides for this meeting will be there as well as soon as they're available. So a useful document. So uh, that's enough from me. Uh, I would like to introduce our speakers today uh, from the uh, ARDC supported um, Monash SERP project. Um, so uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing a bit more about uh, secure platforms for sensitive data. Uh, I in particular, I'm quite interested to hear about the range of different kinds of projects that can be um, that can benefit from using that kind of platform, and a little bit more about what is actually. I think I understand in theory, but understanding a little more about what in practice is involved in getting a project up on one of these platforms. So. Uh, I'm really grateful to Vivka, Matt and Juliana for presenting to us today. And I will stop sharing my screen so that they can present to you. Thank you, Nicola. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. Um, we hope you enjoy our presentation while you are having your lunch. Um, we are here to talk about the scalable governance, control, and management of first sensitive research data project, or more known as the e-research platform, um, secure e-research platform SERP. Matt, if you move to next, thank you. A quick agenda of the um, main items we're going to take you through. Thanks, Matt. So we're gonna take you through the need for the project, the project and the lessons that we learned throughout. Um, 
So SEP project um, is co-founded by the ARDC and is a national collaboration across multiple institutions. Um, we deliver a secure, trusted, and a scalable environment for data governance, control, and management services for data custodians. But we also provide a secure uh, remote data analysis environment for researchers. The primary objective of uh, the project is to lower the barriers to making sensitive data fair, findable, accessible, and interoperable and reusable. We do this by emerging technologies, processes, and controls to, be, to build the trust between data custodians, researchers, and their collaborators, of course. We aim um, to deploy and run trusted prevent technology called the SEP software, software um, to stack and is merged, um, is managed nationally consistent by a consistent service. Um, we will achieve this by um, deploying a multi-tenancy arrangements and to enable research collaborators across jurisdictional uh, boundaries. Um, there was a slightly change of scope last year um, to expand to a national platform, and that's key point, um, which was developed to service the University of Queensland. We will talk a little bit more about key point um, in a minute. Um, our second aim is to onboard exemplar projects, research exemplar projects on the SERP service, and integrate the SERP across the specific research applications. This will help us to demonstrate the capabilities and the benefits using the platform. And our term. Um, aim is to establish three community of practice, data custodians, users, and infrastructure COP. And we, we want with these communities to enable training, knowledge sharing, development, and the dissemination of best practices and principles related to the use of the SERP service. Matt, thank you. The need for the project, for the service, the data custodians are responsible for managing sensitive data. They require a robust and secure environment to ensure the proper data governance and control. And we've identified several drivers uh, behind these needs for data custodians. So there is a lack of control. So data custodians must have mechanisms in place to remain control over their data and prevent unauthorized releases or loss. Um, also ensuring that data is used only for authorized purposes. This is a significant concern for data custodians. We also identified the need to enforce um, strict access control to, pre um, to prevent the inappropriate use of sharing and the sensitive data. There are also several factors that influence the need to improve the sensitive data collaboration. As the data protection uh, regulations become more strict, data custodians and researchers need to adapt to ensure uh, compliance and privacy protection. This also take concerns for organizational reputational risk. Um, nowadays, organizations really recognize the potential uh, of reputational damage if sensitive data is mishandled or misused, so leading the reinforcement of secure collaborations in practices. So this is very important. Um, with the advancement of um, data-driven projects, there is a growing demand for um, data to be fair, so collaboration between data custodians, researchers is crucial for achieving these goals. Thank you, Matt. By understanding the drivers um, behind these needs of both the data custodians and the researchers, we can work towards bridging the gap, which is crucial for advancing knowledge while also ensuring data security and compliance. Uh, to meet these needs, um, Monash, we established a research collaboration with Swansea University in the UK. Uh, to adapt and deploy an instance of the SERP service on the ARDC's Nectar Richer Cloud. SERP has the potential to be scaled nationally to enable Australian institutions to manage their own data while also supporting effective cross institutional collaborations. Thank you, Matt. We offer a user-friendly interface with a single, easy to understand and navigate user, user experience. 
um, where users can efficiently manage their projects without any hassle. Um, SERP allows users to manage and provide data quality information right at the point of the upload. Uh, users can also easily access, um, uh, sorry, assess the quality of their data sets, enabling them to trust and utilize their um, with confidence. Um, we offer a full suite of analytical tools, allowing users to work with the products um, they're more familiar with, um, either a statistical software, programming languages, visualization of tools. Um, our platform will support seamless integration for a small analytical workflow. And we know and understand that data comes in various forms and formats. So our platform also accommodates the structure and unstructured data providing flexible, uh, flexibility to store and analyze um, diverse data sets. Um, SERP provides a secure and remote access, enabling users to work from anywhere in the world, regardless of their location, which is very important these days as well. Thank you, Matt. So I briefly mentioned that key point um, is an outcome of the project that was um, again to um, attend the needs of the University of Queensland and is a data analysis platform that was developed by QCIV. Um, it has been co-designed to meet the diverse requirement of the researchers in the UQ, providing them with all the necessary infrastructure, software system and analytical tools to conduct um, powerful data analysis um, as addressing of the, the research questions. Um, key point is still in version one, and it was released end of last month, uh, but it is still testing and uh, well, just to ensure the optimal performance and reliability. So it'll be ready, ready very soon. Um, thank you. I think that's all for myself. Yes, thank you, Matt. I will now hand it over to Vivek from UNSW. Uh, partners of the project, and we will be back. We'll take you over their on border example projects and challenges they've faced, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Juliana. So, yes, I'm Vivica Katz. I'm the research manager at the Center for Healthy Brain Aging at UNSW. Um, and as way of background, our center collects data from a number of longitudinal cohort studies of older adults. And we have a, a long history of sharing this data with, um, um, sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> we have a history of sharing this data both with people within our team, but also with researchers from around the world. And one of the things that Chiba does as well is that we uh, lead a consortia called COSMIC, uh, which has data partners or partners in on all six populated continents. Um, and the sharing of that data is, is uh, quite complex. So based on all this, the previous data manager at Chiba, Kristen Kang, um, established a partnership with the Minches Platform UK, um, which uses the Swansea SERP for their data sharing. And DPUK has been extremely generous in sharing all their know-how and templates with us, uh, which has been very helpful in uh, establishing DPAU. At this point, Dimensions Platform Australia is uh, servicing only studies as part of COSMIC because that's what we've got NIH funding for. Um, and it's been also very, very helpful that we've got the AIDC funding and is part of the, the SERP project at Monash. Um, it's taken a little while to get the tenancy agreement in place. Uh, that's definitely one of the learnings and challenges. Getting legal sign off on agreements um, is a time consuming uh, process. But in any case, we've gotten there. Um, so the platform, well, it able, in, in, it aims to enable lots of dementia research, uh, which of course is a big global health challenge, um, leading cause of death um, in Australia. And of course it's gonna increase as our population ages because age is the biggest risk factor for dementia. Um, and 
I guess we know from our own experience with our own data set how important it is to have a secure way of exchanging data. Um, I feel like when you send your data to a researcher somewhere, you can never be quite certain that they're going to do the right things with it. Will they store it appropriately? Will they not share it with other people, etc.? And the other beautiful thing about SERP for us is the uh, multiple institutions that one can contribute data sets and also the multiple institution and researchers who can access them from anywhere around the globe. Matt, could you advance the slide, please? <laughs> okay, so um, DPAU is a data platform to enable scientists to discover and access data from what we call contributing research studies, which are the data custodians, and in that way to allow secondary data analysis to uh, aid in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of dementia and age-related diseases. So maybe just talk a little bit about the types of data that people collect. Uh, so there are questionnaire-style data about Men, medical history, physical and mental health status, medication use, family history, lifestyle, uh, prior trauma. Some of this data is definitely quite sensitive and we don't want people to be re-identified. Uh, we do at least at Chiba, but many other studies of this kind do medical exams, that do neuro neuropsychological exams to examine people's uh, cognition, memory and thinking, uh, IQ. Uh, mental health assessments, uh, again, highly sensitive. Uh, we collect uh, imaging data, uh, so MRI scans and PET scans of brains, and these scans may include identifying facial features. Uh, there are ways to remove those features, but then you know, you're not, no longer dealing with the raw data and you may be removing some opportunities for analysis in the future. Uh, we collect genomics data, including whole genome sequencing, and I'm sure this audience knows that these days that actually can be quite identifying, you know, with the advent of 23andMe and, and Ancestry.com and, you know, crimes being solved by people's DNA sequence because they can identify close relatives, etc. It's potentially, um, de-identified data is actually in this way quite potentially quite re-identifiable. Um, we also collect digital, digital data, such as recording of voice, and uh, there's a move within dementia research to collect more digital data, such as geospatial data on a participant's residence and their movement in the local area. And we also know that this sort of data now, with the use of AI and other technologies, can be potentially re-identifiable. Um, so these types of data are sensitive um, and may allow a person to be re-identified now or in the future. And I think this is where SERP really um, comes into its own because we have good control over where the data sits and the ex potential export of any data or identifying information. Um, and it just really means that all the data custodians can sleep a little bit better at night. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. So the DPAU uh, platform consists not just of the data warehouse on the SERP. If we have a public face and information website, and on that website, you can see a study directory with some sort of big picture metadata of the studies that uh, are contributing to DPAU. We have a matrix that shows um, uses the studies and the sample sizes, but also what types of data each study has collected. Do they have a medical exam? Do they have MRI scans? Do they have genetics data? Um, so it's sort of big picture, but it can give you an idea of, oh, there may be four or five studies on in the matrix that actually could help you address your research question. Um, and then we have a, a data explorer, which is behind a, a login. Um, but anyone with an educational email address can easily get a log into this. And the Explorer provides um, access to de-identified but individual level data for um, a subset of about 30 variables. So things like age, smoking, um, 
whether the person has a dementia diagnosis or a particular prominent genotype that uh, leaves um, high dis predisposition to dementia called APOE. Um, and then we also have an online data application form. So we actually provide some level of governance or assist the contributing research studies with the governance. So any study that deposits data with us will have to sign a data deposit agreement and any project that results from a successful data application uh, will, will have to sign a data access agreement. Um, then the contributing research study data are stored on Monash SERP and then it's provided in a separate folder to each approved DPAU project in accordance with what they have, what the applicant have ticked on their data application form. The DPAU projects can also import additional data onto the SERP. So say we don't have all the Chiba studies on SERP at the moment. Uh, someone might want to combine something that is on SERP with the data set they already hold. Uh, elsewhere, they can import that so they can do a mega analysis and actually do the analysis across the data sets. Um, any results or graphs or anything people want to use in papers, manuscripts, uh, the export of those results is monitored by DPAU staff. Um, so you can, you know, you have some oversight over that people are not just, you know, exporting the whole data set or anything inappropriate like that. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. So this slide, I uh, want to just try and demonstrate how DPIU um, adheres both to FAIR and the five safes. Uh, so FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable are all in salmon orangey colored text below. And the five safes is in teal. So five safes relating to project people, data settings, and output. So in terms of making the data findable, uh, we have the data directory and matrix, which is public facing. And then we have the data explorer. And it just shows on the left, you can, when you go into the data explorer, you can select what type of data you are interested in. So I'm interested in alcohol. I only want to know how many people that may have data on alcohol, whether they never used it or currently used it or used it in the past. I don't want anyone who only has missing data on alcohol. And I could then do a similar thing for smoking or genotypes. They are only interested in people who have the APO4 risk genotype. I can then filter my data on these types of variables. And also at a study level, I can say I'm only interested in studies where they actually collected MRI data. And then you'll get some high level output of how many people uh, may fit your criteria and what sort of sample size could you potentially um, garner by collating data across multiple studies. Um, you can also so filter on, say, I only interested in studies that are conducted in Southeast Asia uh, or in low income countries. Uh, there's quite a few different uh, things, both at a study level and an individual participant level that you can uh, filter your data on. So. The next uh, panel across with the theme, domain, family, and variable, that refers to uh, an, a data ontology that the collaborators at DPUK have been developing called the CSERV data ontology. And this helps to make the data interoperable. Uh, you know, if you want to combine data across multiple data sets, you will find that people code six in many different ways. And actually, if you want to then combine it and do the analysis, uh, it's tedious. So the CSERV has a, a standardized way of categorizing data into themes. And then you go down into, so theme could be medical exam data, it could be medical history data, um, and then domain, you kind of breaking down in further into categories until you get to the variable. And the naming of the variable has um, a structured way of doing it. Uh, so this, of course, helps make the data interoperable. But it also helps us to keep the data safe while allowing the data explorer to actually do its work. Right? If we standardize the data across for the small number of variables across studies, 
it allows people to actually do a little bit of exploration before they submit their data request uh, to see that their analysis is going to be feasible without revealing to them the individual data points. Uh, so the next panel, I guess, is around the application form and the governance that uh, the website and DPAU supports. So it makes the data accessible and reusable, but in a safe way in terms of keeping the project safe. People have to apply, they actually have to describe what they're going to do. Um, and it also means you can do some vetting of uh, the people who are going to access the data and only with the access to the SERP, you're ensuring that only the people who are approved to access the data actually are accessing it. Of course, sharing of your password for the SERP is a big no-no, and that's ensured by multi-factor authentication. Uh, and then we get to the SERP itself. It makes the data accessible and reusable uh, by anyone with the right credentials um, across the globe. It keeps the data safe. You don't have to worry about someone uh, doing you know, reverse uh, engineering of the data to identify participants for whatever weird reason people might have to doing that. Uh, it's a very safe setting. And of course, with the monitoring of the output, the output is safe. We have an idea of what people are outputting from the SERP and we can deny output requests if we don't feel that that's appropriate. Uh, so the SERP, provides the data storage, multi-factor authentication for access, uh, and monitored export of results. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges um, and lessons. Oh, it needs a lot of money, and it needs a lot of time, and it's slow. So we've our teams received NIH funding to establish the DPAU for sharing a cosmic member studies data. Uh, which I said covered six continents um, and COSMIC has 58 member studies and we approached them all uh, from 2022 onwards and the pie chart on your right just shows uh, the engagement we've had. So a small percentage starting at 12 o'clock uh, have declined. Uh, a number of studies have said they're unable to engage. Um, so most of the reasons for that is that the data custodians have limited resources to curate the data even to the basic level that we require and to you know dig out their metadata and the data sets and actually provide them in an interpretable way to us. We are offering to assist them with application of the, the CSERF ontology, but just even to kind of get everything together and have the energy to and momentum to actually get the data delivered to DPAU is a barrier for some studies. Um, we have um, some, a handful of studies where the, the principal investigator is reviewing the process uh, and making up their mind about whether they can engage with it. Um, quite a number of studies are sitting with the, uh, I guess, contracts and legal offices of their institution awaiting review. And as I said, this is quite time consuming. It can take months before it gets pushed through. And then we have a small handful of studies that are signed up. And we've also offered, um, because we realize it can be a barrier, that some studies will only provide their metadata. So at this point in time, they won't be providing the data to sit on uh, the SERP, but they are providing metadata and in some instances, also sufficient data to populate the Explorer. And at least in that way, it makes their data findable. And it may be that these studies have already in place a different application process, and they don't want to complicate it by adding the DPAU on, on top of that. And so people can find the data, they can apply directly to the data custodian. And then if they're approved and they want to combine it with other data on the SERP, they can import it. Um, and I guess one of the things that we are really grateful for is that the ARDC funding really provided the necessary focus to establish a relationship with Monash SERP and to facilitate the local learning here at Chiba. We don't, I'm definitely not a techie person. I think everybody in the project knows that now. Um, we don't really have the resources within our team to establish anything like this 
by ourselves and I think our relationship with um the with Monash has actually made the SERP onboarding the smallest challenge for DPAU so super grateful for that uh next slide please Matt so at this point in time we've focused on what I call flat file data uh, but there is also a need at some point to expand that to onboard imaging and genetics data. Um, and I know our colleagues at uh, DP UK uh, have already managed this in some way. And we are hopeful that once we get more grant funding, uh, that we will have the resources to, to expand that to uh, DPAU as well. Uh, the other challenge, I guess, is that um, we know that harmonization methods need more effort and thought to optimize. Um, even like if you do a, a neuropsychological assessment, um, people don't always use the same instruments. They may have different ways of measuring uh, what we call processing speed or executive function or different types of cognition. And so there's different ways of, of harmonizing that. And this definitely needs more effort. There are um, great enthusiasm for federated analyses. And of course, DPAU complements very closely the Ventures Platform UK, who have onboarded for 51 studies, and also the Alzheimer's Disease Data Initiative. They have a slightly different setup called the, the Alzheimer's Workbench, um, but they are also applying the CSERV ontology um, to the 48 studies that they have onboarded. Um, so it, the ontology actually opens really up the door to do federated analyses in a more uh, efficient way. Um, we are talking both to ADI and to DPUK about developing interoperability across platforms, uh, architectures to allow this federated analyses across data sets located in multiple regions. Um, our DPAU manager is currently involved in um, a federated analysis with uh, the people at DP UK, where they've got the variables and data dictionary, and then they're writing the script in UK, and Roy is running the script on our data here. But even just doing that is, is actually quite complicated um, and time consuming. Um, and that's it for me. I'm going to hand back, I think, to Matt. Uh, thank you, Rebecca and Juliana. Thank you uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Matt Ishek, a Senior Project Officer at Monash University and manage many of the deployments to Monash SERP. I will talk to some of the interesting technical challenges we have encountered for this project. Firstly, XNAT. Uh, XNAT is fundamental to one of our exemplar projects and is an open source application used to receive and store medical images from hospitals. A review and testing was completed to ensure the application can be controlled in a sufficient manner and can be accessed by approved users only. Uh, once this was completed, a script was developed and made available to projects to allow the download of images from XNAT direct to STIRP storage. Uh, risks were identified and in, cons in consultation with project stakeholders, uh, governance restrictions uh, were put in place. For example, when it is configured for a project uh, to be able to access XNAT from SERP, uh, it does mean that all members who have access to both the SERP project and the XNET project uh, can uh, be able to have the ability to make the downloads. Uh, so as part of a risk mit mitigation for this, access to the XNET repository was restricted only to a very limited number of users, approved users, and the U XNET utils application used to download this to SERP was, um, the permissions were only allowed uh, for this for a very specific and small window while the data custodians could set up the project. Uh, we also had issues using the most recent version of the XNET Utils tools. Um, we did have to revert to an older 2020 version of the application to get this to work to, due to a, a bug with the software that had not had been introduced in the most recent version. Uh, issues like this add, on, add to the ongoing maintenance of projects required to ensure the service is maintained to a satisfactory level. 
Uh, also, Active Directory uh, at its core, uh, SERP integrates with the Monash University Active Directory for provisioning of projects, managing of the memberships and their corresponding roles and permissions. Uh, SERP requires full delegated access to the Active Directory systems to manage these aspects. Uh, and um, as you can imagine, that's um, we aren't able to do that fully um, due to some restrictions with Monash University and allowing access to the Active Directory. As a result, we have developed a custom uh, integration tool for Monash SERP in consultation with Swansea. This does uh, allow us to communicate with the Active Directory, but not have direct control. The restrictions this currently puts on us is that all users must have a Monash ID created to utilize the platform. Uh, this means um, every user um, with uh, external institutions must have a Monash email address to access and also matching multi-factor authentication. This is still a work in progress. We are always looking to improve this. Um, we always look at new opportunities uh, and new technologies that we can do to um, help with this situation. Uh, for hardware, um, this has been a real challenge, especially since um, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, has amplified the situation. Uh, this has led to increased lead times and the scarcity of some components, especially with procurement of GPU capable hardware. Uh, costs are also on the rise in this area and need to be considered when forward planning. Uh, we've mitigated this by carefully reviewing our usage and ensuring we're submitting procurements only for what is required and carefully managing this on a regular basis. We're doing quarterly procurement submissions uh, to ensure we have enough, but um, we only are really ordering what we need when we need it. Uh, for software and uh, various project requirements, um, from a general perspective, each project has unique requirements um, in, in, each, in, in their own way. Uh, for software, projects require specific software usually. Uh, for example, we have received increased requests for specific geolocation or mapping software that requires integration with online mapping tools and package specific package repositories. The effort to complete due diligence on this software to ensure it meets our security standards and to configure the software to download maps in a safe and secure manner requires extensive effort. For resourcing purposes, it is important to assess each project on its merits and understand the software requirements and data being used. This ensures the appropriate hardware and software is available for each project. Uh, some other lessons learnt, and um, Vivek did touch on, on some of these as well. Uh, so project onboarding, um, it's very important to get early buy-in from project. It was very helpful to have stakeholders immediately uh, to consult with and to understand uh, the requirements and be able to build uh, the platform to those requirements uh, without that buy-in and constant consultation. Uh, that is very, diff very difficult. Uh, as Vivek mentioned as well, legal agreements uh, not established early um, did create some significant delays for the project. Um, so do encourage these to be um, started as soon as possible, um, even drafting um, before projects if possible, so that you have an understanding of, of what you're um, dealing with. And there's always usually delays with um, just dealing with legal teams. Uh, also, this relates exactly to ethical approvals as well. Um, as Vivek mentioned, um, onboarding can be easy, but actually um, waiting for ethical approvals or other agreements um, can take a long time. Um, we did have a very successful um, collaboration efforts with um, our communities of practice, uh, where the community um, collaborated uh, to create training guides, minimum requirements for trusted research environments and a shared knowledge base, which is being uh, actively used by the platforms in the community. Uh, compute power um, for one project was not sufficient and we did have to find uh, another solution. Uh, this was due to uh, hardware limitations on what was available um, for us to purchase. We did require a very um, high powered machine that we could not get in a satisfactory time. So we did have to shift one project um, to a different infrastructure to allow use of a um, uh, high, high, um, high capacity computing. Also listed some um, some operational needs and uh, agreements that are important to have uh, for this kind of projects. Um, these slides will be shared after the agreement, so don't um, don't worry about uh, writing these down or anything. I won't. Um, I will make these available um, afterwards. Uh, finally, here's an example of some of the interesting work we are helping to facilitate. 
the RISE project is evaluating the impact of health interventions within specific at-risk communities. A whole high volume of unstructured data is being passed through the platform. The second project, Praise, uses AI and machine learning to predict fracture outcomes for Victorian trauma patients. This project requires high GPU compute capacity and high volume data transfers of clinical images. ASMID is establishing a unique imaging repository comprising 3D body images. This involves the integration of XNAT that was mentioned earlier with SERP and Keypoint with the ability to establish the use of demoscopy mapping software available on the platforms. SERP and Keypoint is also supporting the ATLAS project, which routinely acquires electronic medical records related to sexual disease transmission. This is using data linkage technology to facilitate the merging of additional national data collections. And um, thank you for your time today. Um, I'll stop sharing now. Fantastic, thanks all. Um, that's a really, it's interesting to see the range that it's not just the medical, because I know that this kind of um, platform has, has emerged from medical research, but, or been highly used by medical research, but to see it um, starting to be um, utilized by other kinds of project is really interesting. Um, I, yeah, I'll open the, the floor to any questions we might have, um, either if people want to put them in the chat or just uh, throw a hand up either way. Yeah, Kristen. Uh, I'll get the ball rolling. Um, Matt, something that I saw on that last slide that caught my attention uh because i don't know much about it and i feel like it's something i'm going to have to learn about uh doing a peer that privacy impact assessment um was that specifically was that the SERP itself was that a kind of project level i don't know much about peers i've started to hear them in different discussions i know that ondc data place uh has had one or is doing one currently um could you give us a bit of information about that absolutely um your question and thank you, Kristen, for kicking us off. Appreciate it. Um, can always rely on you. Um, <laughs> the the private impact assessment is fundamentally going to need to be done on a project by project basis. We do one thing we've learned from this is that you know, as you're aware, you just said you're not not aware of how it works and what needs to be done, and we found that's pretty common. So what we've tried to do is collect the information of what is required. Um, so there is some foreknowledge of, of what's ahead and what is required. So uh, yes, we did do, so how it works here at Monash is we have, um, as part of the OGC, which is the, the legal office at Monash University, we have a sub office called the Data Protection and Privacy Office. So they have um, a template they follow um, for a private impact assessment. Um, and we answer the questions with them and they provide us a recommendation. Um, from this project, we have developed a template of the questions that can be asked. So an understanding of um, what, what is required is available. Um, but usually um, the advice from legal is that this is done on a project by project basis, um, not on a platform uh, level. Obviously, a lot of the questions are going to be the same on a project basis because it's related to platform specific governance, et cetera. Um, so it'd be very similar questions and answers. Excellent, thank you. Uh, oh, and just to, we had a question before about whether we'll be able to share the slides. And as Matt said, we'll um, we'll make those available. Um, I'll both email them around and link them from the collaborative doc. So thanks to our presenters for sharing those. Oh, Steve, your hand is up. Yeah, I, um, I was interested on the the harmonisation question with um, the, the dementia platforms um, because I mean, as you say, this is kind of the how do you facilitate the interoperability between systems? Um, it sounded like that was that was a significant part of the result. You know, your, your non response or your declined response from um, the your possible partners was we don't have the time to do the harmonization fundamentally. Um, and I say we're, we're kind of working on a couple of projects around this as well, 
um, with ADA and you know, the various projects we're in. Um, what is this? I mean, essentially, I'm guessing this is a manual process you've kind of got to go through. You just got to map, produce, and then, you know, could you describe a little bit about that as to what the resource intensity is? Because this is a, it often, this is where, the, you know, the heavy lifting comes from. Yeah. So just on those projects, they don't actually have to do any harmonization themselves necessarily. Um, they just have to deliver the data. But I think if people don't share it regularly, it's not necessarily going to have a good data dictionary or, or anything like that. And you, you know, if you, you've got to make it available, you've got to make it usable as well. The ontology, um, I know that the DPUK group are working with people to apply some type of machine learning to at least try to predict what a variable might be. Uh, and then there would be some human oversight to see, yeah, well, yes, that gender is sex or, you know, some of those easy ones, or hopefully it would pick up. And they're up to about 80% accuracy uh, with that. So that definitely is a help. So that's kind of just to get the variables labeled appropriately. But then, you know, there's the second level harmonization. Okay, uh, males always coded one, females two or whatever. Um, and I know the, actually the Eddy group have developed a, a, a tool to help with that. But my colleague who's much more into coding, et cetera, says it's easier just to do it yourself. But if it's a non-expert like me, I might actually choose to use the online tool if it's a student. Um, and I guess the idea for DPAU is as people work with the data set and these recoding of data is, is done that we try and at least within the cosmic consortia to kind of get it consistent across the data sets that are being used. And then, okay, harmonization, when people don't collect data in the same way, I mean, sex is relatively easy. You could go by the chromosomes or what people identify as, um, but Imaging data, if you use a different scanner for your MRI scans, um, which you know people by nature are going to do, they're not all in the same city, in the same institution. Um, one of the things Cosmic likes to look at is differences in ethnicities. But well, if the Asian study is done in Hong Kong and the Caucasian study is done in Sydney, well, is it the ethnicity or is it the scanner that's causing the difference in how people's brain volumes might be different, etc. So there's lots of complexity around that. And I think I've, we've recently been looking actually at the, some imaging projects with some people from Swansea. Um, you know, I think sometimes people kind of just put their head in the sand and say, we're just going to go ahead and do the analysis. But I don't know that there's enough rigor in making sure that the measures are comparable across studies. Um, that's probably a particularly challenging one. Um, other times people kind of just use set scores, et cetera, and kind of center the means and, and try and make the data sets comparable in that way. But again, you may be washing out differences between groups by statistically trying to make them comparable. Thanks, Vivka. And I see we've got um, a couple more uh, quick questions. Uh, one is, uh, is there a technical architecture document for the DPAU site that could be shared? No. <laughs> okay, fair um, so <laughs> I know that the Data Explorer, uh, Rory has been building that in our shiny and she is uh, looking to publish that and make the code, uh, et cetera, for that uh, available. And, you know, I think she's found, okay, she built it and then she went back to actually document it so that other people could use and understand her script. And that in itself is is challenging. So she's she's working on that. Uh, the website, et cetera, we utilized sort of the template that DPUK had, but we rebuilt it um, at end. Um, so there are probably procedures and manuals, but no, there's not a neat little package with a bow on it that can say, here you go. Okay, thanks. And uh, we did have, oh, and uh, our next question has already been answered, <laughs> which was, uh, could you elaborate on the reasons or requirements that drove the development of the new Keypoint platform for QCIF? And Matt has responded, uh, we could not realistically deploy, deploy to QCIF in the time and cost required. And that's for the, the, the timelines of the project. It just wasn't feasible to get that done with legal agreements and whatnot. It was going to, that really needed to start a lot earlier. 
um, for that to be realistic um, does take a lot of time, which was really underestimated. Um, well, I had a, a question. Sorry, Nicola, if I can just interrupt there. I kind of wanted to make a point on that also on the cost, right? It's nice to want to data share, but if you don't have the resources to do it, um, it's really hard. Okay, Chiba is kind of lucky we've got a lot of philanthropic funding and we spend some of that on our data sharing um, efforts. Um, but you know, you need people and you need to pay for the infrastructure, you know, having your digital data, as you know, from e research last year, right? Uh, it costs money to have it sitting somewhere. Um, and you know, having a tenancy on SERP doesn't come for nothing. Um, so I don't know, if we kind of, if we want to do more data sharing, we kind of have to build in those costs somehow in when we seek our funding. That's an excellent point. Um, so, and I was going to ask, it's, it's almost a related question, I think, because I, I mentioned, Matt, that um, people who uh, access SERP need to have Monash uh, credentials. And that's not a, I mean, I, I guess I don't know about the process for uh, for acquiring that for um, at Monash, but I, is that still a, a fairly manual process? Is there a, you know, a, a time delay? Are there limits on the number of people who will be, um, who can, who can do that? I, yeah, mm -hmm. I have questions. Yeah, no, well, there's no real limits um, for one, there's a lot there. So, um, it is it is more steps so we have a relationship with um, the identity team at the university um, they understand their intentions for why we're using these accounts they're a very stripped down account so they don't have access to all monash systems it just gives you access to an email and gives you an entry into the active directory so we can have a, a listing for them basically um, we then like to link that to serp so um, it's a technical hurdle we've uh, had to put into our uh, operations um, we have a, like I said, a relationship with the identity team. So when we do onboard um, our external partners, we are able to quickly collect that information for user information, submit that to the identity team. We usually get them back within a couple of hours, honestly, yeah. but the agreement is within a couple of days. Um, they'll have them ready for us, but typically it's within 24 hours um, and usually you know, very, very quickly. So we can still turn them around very quickly. It doesn't affect us, except for the fact that it's a couple of additional steps in the workflow. Um, and that, you know, it is a, an inconvenience for external users in the sense that um, they'll need an additional um, MFA method um, from their typical account. There will be a second account they'll have to manage as well to connect to um, SERP. That could mean um, basically, you know, if they're, if they're using, they'll need Okta or Google Authenticator. So if you've got one of those apps already, it's usually pretty simple, but if not, you will need to install it. Most people these days do have um, MFA on their phones. Um, so um, that is, isn't so much of a hurdle, but the fact that you need to rely on a second account to access it is, and something we're constantly looking for new ways to improve. Um, there's actually been some new news just in the last few weeks that we need to investigate. Um, and we're waiting for some updates from our eSolutions team to understand the ramifications. So that's... Um fantastic in terms of that that relationship that you have with the identity team I think I could see that being an incredibly important thing in terms of managing uh, yeah how that works yeah uh, we just have five minutes and we do have a little bit of um closing up admin so um, I think we might just take this last question uh do you store data on SERP how does retention and disposal work that data yes so we SERP is, is really an application layer it's a, a management layer to to manage the access to the virtual machines manage file in requests file out requests and users and attached to that is our secure storage that we manage here at Monash so that secure storage is is accessible only um, in SERP within a secure private network um, it's a dedicated hardware and infrastructure within our existing uh, data center um, for for retention we basically set review periods on uh, a 12 month uh, basis to check in with projects make sure nothing's changed uh, and that um, they're happy to keep storing the data um, for disposal um, first there's a backup so whenever the data change there is a, a most recent backup stored 
Um, so for disposal, uh, we have an offboarding process where we need to gather some key information. Um, so first off, you know, is it to be disposed of completely or to be archived? And then depending on those answers, it'll branch off the workflow into how we'll um, act on that. Um, but we do have a, an archival process, whether it be five years, seven years, which is mostly the standard or indefinite, uh, or we have a um, disposable method where we um, destroy the data is how we label it. Yeah, excellent. So the intention is not that the SERP secure storage is the long time long term home for the data, but rather that um, if it needs to be retained long term, it is moved into archive. Correct. Yeah. Sorry, that's one thing I missed saying there is that SERP is not a storage location. It's an analysis platform. So we shift data in and out as required. Um, some data can be in there for you know a couple of years or more. It's, that's fine if it's being actively used, but we do know use it as an active storage. We have uh, longer term storage infrastructure we'll shift it to. Great, thank you very much. Um, well, I'd like to thank you again for, uh, for the presentation and for everyone for the discussion afterwards. That was uh, really informative for me, definitely, as this is not my area of expertise, but is an area of great interest. Um, I would, uh, before we go, um, I'll just throw to my co-chair, Kristen, who uh, would like to um, share an event that may be of interest to you all. Thank you. Yes, uh, before we go, it's cross-promotion time. Um, so the program that I manage is called the Hassand Program. I know that a number of people on this call are involved with the program in different ways. It is ARDC's co-design program, uh, currently with the clinical trials community but going to be expanded uh, in the next few months and then over the next few years uh, to address uh, health research beyond clinical trials. Um, the program's been running for three years. Uh, the, we're launching the platform that's coming out. That's one of the major outputs out of that program. So it's a, a data discovery platform. So if you're a researcher looking for clinical trials data uh, in Australia, there is now a national platform that you'll be able to search for it, and also a platform that you can then request access to the data in one spot rather than going through um, uh, to a whole lot of different people and their different email addresses. So uh, in a few weeks' time, on July 18th, we're going to be doing our formal uh, showcase and launch uh, of Asanda and the platform. Uh, Nicola, oh, already put the uh, Eventbrite link in chat um, and I've just done it as well. So yeah, I uh, encourage you all to come along and um, yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Um, well, that sounds sounds like uh, an event that could be pretty relevant to most of the people here. <laughs> um, so uh, then all I have to say again is uh, thank you to everyone for uh, for attending today. Um, we will uh, send you the link to the recording and the slides, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.